for me. Um, so anyway, uh, welcome. I'm glad everyone could be here. And I think there's some more that are going to trickle in here. Um, so I think I would just like us to start out with some introductions to everyone who we all are before we ever go into any meeting of business, from Chef Powell and the president, whatever that means in this organization. I usually get to ask people like Brian to do stuff for us. And um, I teach at Green Mountain High School, and I'm teaching, among other things, the computer science principles of college. I'm just glad that he's making this one. And he has a piano set inside, the intro programming AP. Our good room is here at college. See the scope? Say it slower. Uh, that's that's you, you, assume, you assume that these are rows. So. Rows are helpful. That's right. Real major problem. I'm Ben Shapiro. I'm a professor at CU in computer science and in the Atlas Institute, and I also am part of the School of Education, and I do CS Education Research. I'm Bob Gaston. I teach at Fulton Technical Education Center in Adamsville. I teach intro to computer science. I'm Fred Luck. I uh, also volunteer, but I teach for CU's science discovery program and also for the Scalable Game Design Project, which is an NSF project at CU. Hey, my name is John Cabot. I basically retired from July from Intel and Code Protocol, uh, Oregon. Uh, I came back home here and uh, I'm a volunteer advisor to the Pico Vodic Club of the for all here. I'm Jeremy Paul. I teach at Middle High School, uh, Technology and Computer Science. I'm Zahn DeGreese. I teach Middle School Computer Science and Electronics. And I teach um, classes that I kind of made up myself and I'm still sort of making up. Um, middle School Computer Science, Middle School Electronics, um, Middle School Minecraft. Uh, Jen Cooper, Mount Range High School, and this semester I'm teaching Web Design and Visual Basic. I know, right? I feel like I'm Sherry Elbers, and I teach intro, intermediate, and AP computer science at Cassidue High School. I teach web page for web design, advanced and beginning, and advisor of the web team. And um, I teach gaming also. And I'm trying to take minutes for this meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm Ryan Adams. I teach, uh, teach Green Mountain Chuck and I basically do the intro computer science guy in the box. Gail Vantal, I teach at Topeak Middle School and I teach um, technology. I'm Bob Eppensberger, I teach at Peak to Peak uh, High School and I teach everything from the intro through a post AP computer science class. I'm Charity Smith and I teach at Colorado Academy. I'm a math teacher converting to a computer science teacher. <laughs> I teach intro to programming with Python. I'm Kimberly Young. I'm, I'm also at Colorado Academy, and I teach um, the AP Computer Science and opposed to AP Computer Science course there, and hopefully the new AP course as well. I'm Jared Katzman, also at Colorado Academy. I teach uh, intro programming and I'm uh, the director of technology. I'm Todd Luong. Um, I teach that middle school step class. I'm Max O'Reilly, I'm the robotics computer science coordinator at the Innovation Center, uh, St. Mary Valley School District, which is here in Longmont. And I kind of I wear three hats basically. I support K 12 implementation of uh, computer science and robotics within the Skyline computer system. And so, welcome to the district. We're going to build partnerships with uh, businesses, universities. Uh, between our, our school and those uh, organizations. And then I supervise student teams that work with those partners on uh, projects that involve robotics and computer science. I'm Sean Peng, uh, Longmont High School, uh, uh, web design, intro, and computer science. So. Uh, my name is Ryan and I'm a former Microsoft programmer. I started with BB6, Visual Studio 6, and now I'm a, what is it now? 13 or something? That's yeah, great. I'm a transplant from Indiana. I've gotten back to teaching, and I am here at the Career Center as the internship coordinator. And then also working with Axel uh, in computer science. So I thought if you want to know with BB, so BB, um, I 
let's see, I'm really good at DB. Oh, I worked on the XNA framework. If anybody's familiar with XNA framework, it was awesome. So we developed XNA framework with the team. So it's a great way to develop games for the Xbox and Windows and stuff. We have some great functions built in. I don't know, has anybody messed with the XNA framework? It's kind of dead though. Yeah, it sucks. <laughs> Functions that were built on there, but uh, I don't know what happened. So, you know, with Microsoft, they kind of let go of something and then bring something new in. So, okay, okay, working now on the same parade, and so um, we're going to split. Yeah, old boys, right? Yeah, from, from a Microsoft to a. Or a Raider. No, I still like <laughs> So, yeah, I'm a Jack of all trades. I still my own crew lab and have 22 machines coming. So uh, I decked out my house with Raspberry Pi security cameras, so that was always fun. Um, yeah, so uh, I started in 83, so if you remember back then, and then the back came out in 84. I started with a basic class, so I better wrap it up, right? <laughs> so, and I was in Indiana, got involved with CSTA, and now I'm here, so. I turn what question am I answering? Who are you? I'm Rob Colstead. I was coach of the US programming team for 20 years. Uh, we got a new programming language and I'm starting to teach a class in to see if it's gonna work. And I'm here to learn about Arduinos. Oh, I'm from Colorado Springs. Anybody else from Colorado Springs? I am. <laughs> That's Dr. Horton, he's my assistant tonight. He works at Oracle, formerly Sun formerly Prisma Technica, which brought us to the uh, Colorado in the first place to build Gallium Arsenide supercomputers. I'm Paul Leon. I teach at the Institute of STEM School in Hans Ranch. I teach uh, AP Computer Science and Intro to Computer Science. Uh, Tony Garone, I teach at Boulder High, uh, computer science, I teach Java, C++, advanced C++, and AP computer science. I'm Sue Johnson, I teach at Monarch High School, and I teach, we teach pretty much the same courses. I also teach web design, too. And we've been implementing our uh, intro to CS uh, Java using the CS Principles course, so it's been a lot of fun. Um, so really encourage everybody to jump in and get involved. It's a whole bunch of fun. Doing a good job here. Thank you. I am Angie Mortensen. I teach at Everett Middle School and at Weaver High, two part time. So, computer applications, computer programming, web design, advanced computer programming. I'm Stephanie Weber. Um, I'm a program manager at National Center for Women and Information Technology. Um, which is at CU Boulder, and we work with um, CS education and increasing diversity in the field of CS. I'm Tim Hofford. I teach at Dakota Ridge High School in Middleton. Um, I teach computer science and, and math, but computer science, advanced AP, IB. Um, teaching Python, which is new this year for my program. Did I ever think you get a chance to say hello to this? You are. That's Chris L. Judy. He is my protege that I brought over from Syria, uh, who was a programming champion there. He's 18 now. He's the guy that has implemented the new programming language. And most recently, he had the number one app at the Apple App Store. You all need to buy the Purify App Blocker, only $2. I bought that. It's awesome. <laughs> yep, there's your altar right there. No kidding. Yep. Eric Collinson from Hunter High School. I guess I'll be teaching new computer, computer science principles next year. I'll be done. And we'll have you sit down before you sit down. What? Yeah. I'll get to sit. Some enchanting. You are. Molly Parker. I teach. Um, Computer Science at Altona Middle School. And I'm late because I have to do a presentation on Code Week tomorrow and I stay late to finish it. 
Division of Space Flight and Control Center. Uh, yeah, and Flight and Control Center, we have. My name's Mike, and I'm one of the engineers here at Spartan and I also wear another hat as the AP Geek sometimes. So, welcome to Spartan Fun. Yeah. We'd also be a great part of food over the summer. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, and Cindy Prater from Colorado School of Mines, I'll jump ahead and sort of make her introduce herself before she's caught her breath. So here's what we're going to try to do. We're a little bit behind because of traffic already, but about 45 minutes, we're going to turn it over to Brian and let him let us do some, some spark fun stuff. Okay. And Stephanie is going to talk to us a little bit about their e-textiles. And got a few good news announcements. We're going to have some time to go over block-based languages. 40 minutes might seem like a lot, but it's not a lot once we get in there. So everything will seem, seem kind of rushed. I know that's kind of the way it is. And um, we have about five minutes at the end to just talk about our next meeting. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian. But as I do, I want to say thank you, Brian, and thank you for everyone here at Spark Fund for your support of Computer Science Education wow. Colorado. Don't try to check this price out, it's too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We do want to let you know that we appreciate you. Helping. That's exciting. Thank you. All right, so welcome, welcome. Um, so brief <laughs> introduction. I, uh, my name is Brian Huang. I'm a former physics teacher, former engineer uh, before that. And then now I'm still trying to define what I do here at Spark Fund. But uh, what I get to do is I wear the hat of education engineer. I spent uh, eight years designing antennas and telecommunications systems and funny things like that. And then uh, five years in the classroom teaching physics and math and eventually engineering robotics. And so um, in the last three years I've been here at Spark Fund, I've gotten a chance to take what I know as an engineer, or what I think I knew as an engineer, and kind of some ideas of teaching that I'm still trying to figure out how to do and mash those things together. And so um, I'm going to share with you guys some ideas here around Arduino and programming. And the assumption is that you guys have done some programming, whether it's in Java, JavaScript, Basic, uh, Scratch, Python, some language before. Um, and so there's, we're going to go pretty fast. Um, and we're going to use a board called the Digital Sandbox. So. I threw together some slides just so that I've got a uh, backdrop to talk at um, and I don't lose my place. So we're going to talk about this microcontroller. And basically what a microcontroller is, is uh, it's like a little mini brain. It's like the small computer. Um, it doesn't, not too fast, but you know, it's plenty fast enough uh, to do the things we want to do. It's designed to interface with the outside world. Um, it has what we call GPIOs or general purpose input output pins. Uh, it has 20 of those pins. These are just some rough specs of what it can do. It has 32K of memory, which is like tiny, right? When you compare like what's in your phone. But quite honestly, when we want to do some programs, the types of programs we teach in computer science, whether it's Greenfoot or whether it's you know some sort of Python application where you're doing a snake thing, if you actually look at the size of that code, it's not that big. Um, we don't need these big i7 processors to do those computational things. Um, obviously, when you get to big data and stuff like that, you do want big machines. But when you're learning programming, this is a perfect platform. So uh, what is Arduino? Uh, it was designed in 2005 by some folks, these artists in the Design Institute in Nevada. They're Italians. So it has some artistic aspects to it. It was designed for artists. It was designed to allow artists to build things that are interactive and expressive and allow people to write things very simple, like just turning on and off an LED. When I wave my hand over a sensor, the LEDs do something, right? Um, and in the past, you had to know binary and you had to do all this weird bit shifting stuff to do it. And you're like, I'm an artist. I don't want to know what binary 1101 is. I just want the LED to turn on. Um, so this was created around that idea, but in the background, it's C, C++. So if you're a C or C++ person, or if you're fluent in these things, it'll all come very naturally. What has happened, though, is they've wrapped it around, they've wrapped around it some libraries to make the programming easier. So to turn on an LED, we use a command called digital write instead of doing these weird bit shifting things. Um, 
And it was developed in this open source community. So all of the boards, all of the hardware, all the programs, all the code that's out there is provided free and openly. Um, so anyone and everyone can look at the designs. They can remix the boards. They can redesign the boards. They can take the standard Arduino board and shrink it or expand it or customize it and build into their own thing. Um, and so there's two sides. There's both an open source software side, which is the programming environment, and then there's an open source hardware side, which is the actual physical board um, that we're going to do. So let's do some coding. Uh, but before we do that, I want to talk briefly about these two things. So normally we use the, this thing here. This is what we traditionally call an Arduino. Um, it's red. It's our version of it. It's called the red board. Um, and it, we have this little kit that has all these parts, and you have to put breadboards in, and you have to wire it up, you have to learn a little bit about electrical engineering and circuits and all that stuff. Um, about two and a half, three years ago, when I first started here, I was like, it would be great if we had a, a board that was pre-wired, that had all of these things on it. And um, I went to the engineers, and I said, hey, what do you guys think about throwing you know, five LEDs and an RGB thing and some sensors on this board, just wiring it so that I don't have to teach the breadboarding part? And I can just focus on the coding part. And um, the birth of the digital sandbox came out of that. So this is the board that we're going to be using. And I'm going to try to get a, let's see, how many people do we have? We don't have enough boards for everyone, so we're going to try to share. Um, that works. <laughs> we can try to, let's if I can get someone to help pass out, just kind of roughly evenly distribute those, and then thank you. Um, and if you don't have a computer with you um, and you'd like to play, I, we have a, a whole set of computers and laptops that we can use. So just raise your hand. And let's pray that these are charged. So the second question is, um, how many folks here who have a laptop, I think Chuck sent out an email about software that you had to install, got the software installed? I should actually ask the question, who did not get the software installed? That's okay, so if you did not, we're going to do a little swap room. Right, so I know you have a much more powerful, much more than you're did anybody not, or any pair of people not do that before? Yeah. All right, so I don't know how many handouts I have, but we're going to try. I'm just grabbing one and passing it down this way. Go down the road. So if we take a look at the digital sandbox that you guys have in front of you, I also gave you guys a piece of paper, which um, if you'll pause for a minute and don't look at that just yet. Um, but it's okay. Take a look. You can take a look at it. That will walk you through some of the stuff that I'm going to actively walk through with you guys, probably roughly the first page of that. And then the rest of it's resources and materials that you can use um, to walk through and play around with. So this chip right here is the brain. It's an Atmega 328. It's made by this company called Atmel. Um, and it's the brain of the thing. It's what will store the program. So some of you already plugged into your computer, and you'll notice that it may be doing something. Sometimes it's just an LED is on. Sometimes the LED is blinking. Sometimes it has some funny pattern. But um, that's the code that's running on there. And that's one of the coolest things about this is that I don't have to boot up a computer. I don't have to, hold on, hold on, let me run the program. Let me show you what my Raspberry Pi does and then you wait 10 minutes later for them to get everything up and running. You just plug this thing in, and it runs, and it starts working immediately. 
So the, the place that we're gonna spend most of our time is are these five LEDs down here, and they're labeled D4, D5, D6, D7, D8, um, and they're just generically numbers, pin numbers four through eight. Um, on the board too, um, I guess I should just talk about the other things. This is a temperature sensor, looks like a thermometer. It's a light sensor, it looks like the sun, which is kind of opposite from the idea of sensing, but that's okay. Um, a microphone for sensing sound. There's a push button that you can push to get things to happen. There's a little slide switch here, on off, um, or a mode select kind of thing. And then a slider here that you can use to go back and forth. And then we added, we had a couple extra pins left over on the Arduino and we we're like, we should at least expose them. So we have uh, D3 is here as an auxiliary port. Um, I think Gail and Robert bought some extra add-ons for the digital sandbox. You can plug motors and buzzers and other things. We actually purposely chose not to put a buzzer on this for the classroom environment because once one kid starts making noise, they all start making noise. Um, and then at the very top, there's a type of sensor called an I2C or I squared C sensor. Um, and those, that pin out on the top is a, another auxiliary port to connect extra sensors to. Um, it is also pins A4 and A5, and so you could throw any analog sensor you wanted on there, but it's defaulted to be used for I squared C. All right, so uh, let's jump in. Go ahead and open up Arduino if you have it on your machine. When it opens up, it'll look something like this. People who are using our computers, how are the batteries looking on them? You look at the little battery icon, bad? No, no go? Do you have any more cables? I, I do. I have, in fact, I have power cables for them. Yeah, this one's still updating with uh, Windows. Yikes, let's, let's swap you out then. Let's swap you out. Thank you. Let's power so um real quick here um you guys have instructions in front of you, so I'll do. I'll keep the talking to a minimum. Um, but a couple things I want to show you guys about the setup here. So the first thing, the first thing um, I like to do. You'll notice that it's really hard for you guys to read that print unless you guys have really, really good eyesight. Um, so I like to do this. If you go to File Preferences, there's a couple settings I like to change. One of which is the editor font size, and when I do instruction. I kick the font up to at least 24, if not 28 points. The other thing you'll notice is that I also check this display line numbers because it's nice for debugging to know what line number, and you can have all the students to say, I want everyone to look at line number 20, right? And they all go to line 20 and they're like, whatever, right? So, um, and then there's this one that's defaulted, verify code after upload. When we compile the code, it'll take the code, it'll convert it to ones and zeros, the binary stuff, it'll send it to the Arduino, and what the Arduino does is it actually sends it back to the computer saying, hey, this is what I got. It's like this checking, right? And it takes, makes the uploading process twice as long. So um, I uncheck that um, just, to be, just to keep everything quick. And the last thing that you'll notice here is this, it says preferences, if you're a real geek and you like to dig into the customizations, you can actually go in and customize other features of it. There's a preferences.txt file um, that's available there. But anyway, those are the two ones that I like to change. So you'll notice that the text size now is nice and big. You guys can read that, All right? All right, so, oops. So these are the ones that I like to check. Did you miss that? So every sketch starts out the skeleton is pre-populated when you open up Arduino, and it says void setup and void loop. If you're a C programmer, you might be asking, where is the main? Turns out that these two functions are called in the main. Setup is called once, 
and then loop is called inside a forever loop. So if you go digging, you can find the main.cpp file. It's C++. And there's some funny stuff here. I have no idea what these do, but init, initializing something, some other stuff here, some USB things. It calls setup once. And then there's this empty for loop, which is maybe more efficient than a while one. I don't know. It calls loop, and it just does that, right? And so that's the architecture of this. We never ever have to deal with the main part. We write everything inside the loop. So there's three functions that we need to use, that we are going to use. And it's pin mode, digital write, and then delay. The Arduino operates anywhere between 1 megahertz and 20 megahertz, depending on the type of device. This one happens to be running at 8 megahertz. So that's 8 million instructions per second. Right? So that's really, really fast. It's like 125 nanoseconds per instruction. Right? So we had to delay. We had to put delays in there to slow things down so that we can see things happening. Um, oh, before I judge, uh, let's go ahead and just jump in here. So let's go ahead and add some lines of code. We want to make sure that all of the pins that we use are set up as outputs. So if you look at your digital sandbox, the ones that we want to use all five of those LEDs. So those are pins four through eight. So I'm just going to type in pin mode, four comma output. And this is a trick that as computer science teachers, you guys probably know and teach and show your students. But it's a trick that I've found a lot of teachers don't oftentimes explicitly point out to their, their students is the copy paste. So shift arrow, shift down arrow, copy, paste, 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 paste. And then I'm going to change this to five, six, seven, eight. Um, Brian, I want to turn off the Brian LED number 10. I do the same thing for 10. You could do the same thing for 10. In fact, whatever you do uh, will wipe out whatever's running on there. Right. So then our hello world, the hello world of physical computing, Right, in C or Java or whatever, you open up a window and you say, hello world, right? And then you're like, yay, I'm a programmer. Um, in Arduino, we don't have a screen, per se. So our hello world is the blink. And so let's try to recreate a blink. And so if you could see behind this, this window, you'd see that's digital right. And I'm going to use pin 4 to turn it on. I'm going to use the command or the constant high. I'll put a delay in there of 500. And 500 indicates the number of milliseconds. And if I think about what a blink is, a blink is a repeating sequence of on and off. right? So I'm going to stick those two ideas inside my loop. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to paste that in there, change the high to a low. Now I'm done. Now the last thing I need to do is upload this. So there are some directions here at the very top of your sheet. So I've walked through kind of the basics here. And I'm going to now just turn things over to you guys. Um, but you can kind of glance through here of some ideas. If you guys look at the very, very top, there are some board files. There's some special board files that you have to add onto Arduino to use the digital sandbox. So. Uh, if you see here, it says open up a web browser and go to sparkfun.com slash sparkfunboards. I'll do this with you guys so that you can see. Ooh, where is it? So, oops. So, www.sparkfun.com slash sparkfunboards. When I, when I do this, you're going to get a screen of a bunch of garbage that looks like a JSON file, which it actually is a JSON file. I don't want the JSON file, but I want the URL. So I want the address. I want to click on this address. It says raw.github content user something. I'm going to copy that. And then uh, it says in Arduino, go to tools. Oh. Uh, Go to the additional boards manager URLs under file preferences. So file, preferences. And you'll notice right here, 
I'm going to paste that whole ugly URL right there. Is everyone good? Oh, if you're on one of the red machines, you don't have, if you're one of my machines, it's already done. Should be, I think. So click OK. We'll go to Tools now, go to the Boards Manager. Tools, Board Manager, and you're going to search under the filter here. You're going to search for SparkFun. And mine's already installed, but if you click there, you should see a button here that says Install. Where is this, Brian? Under Tools, Boards Manager. So I'm going to do two things here, and I'm going to select the boards file. So under board, you're going to go all the way to the bottom here, and you should find a option here that says Spark Fun Digital Sandbox. And you'll notice that uh, the last thing that has to be set up is the port for it. So select the port. Whoa. So on PCs, it's always it's going to be a COM number. Uh, the COM number is just a random, well, not a random, but a sequential number, three, four, five, six, seven depending on the device you put in it. If it's a uh, Mac, it'll be dev slash TTY or CU dot USB serial something something. Um, then you don't have the driver didn't get installed. If it's if port is grayed out, uh, we can we'll take a look at that. So Go ahead and do that. And the last thing is to upload, which under sketch, upload, and you'll see the bits fly across on your device. Oh, it'll prompt you to save it. You can save it as a file, or you can just hit escape. Now, while it's compiling, you'll notice there is a kind of a status <coughs> message here. And then this is actually all the console stuff. So all the stuff that goes in the background when you do like GCC or if you were to do a make file, all that stuff is happening here. Um, it, 
If you're having problems with it communicating, there's a little link here that says go to sparkfun.com slash FTDI. Right on page three. So here's my fantastic, beautiful blinking LED. So play around with this. There are some directions on here for getting yourself unstuck. Um, also, if you're thoroughly stuck, raise your hand and I can walk around and help you get that.
Thank you. 
There's like a lot of hate with our Dino, right? Like it's true. <laughs> Well, I think we have like several minutes of announcements and then let them at least play through that. Okay, cool. Okay? So, let's see. Okay. Great, thanks. We'll go to here. Okay. How are folks doing? So if you look at this activity guide, um, there's some specific kind of syntactical things that are Arduino specific. I mean, I assume you guys know what for loops are and while loops and arrays, but there's just some examples here in here that's like, oh, that's how I do an array, or that's how I read the button, or that's how I read the sensor value. So um, there's some other examples in here that go further down, um, talk about color mixing with the RGB, or um, the actual real Hello World, where we print back Hello World in what we call the serial monitor. So these are all additional examples. Um, Chuck's got some announcements. You guys can keep playing. And yeah, so if you see I do, we have some news and some announcements. But since you have this and stuff in front of you, you can just keep on playing and pretend that you're paying attention and it's fun. Um, so first of all, um, Cindy, you want to share some stuff with us about what's going on for us through Colorado School of Mines? Sure, we'll be happy to. So, how many of you got the email from Tracy about uh, PD opportunities for CS in Colorado? Excellent. How many of you are thinking that you want to participate in PD this summer? Excellent. Tracy said as of yesterday she had four answers to the survey. Not excellent. <laughs> so, this is not a complete commitment, but what, what we want to do on this survey is figure out how to better work with you and do the things that you need for the summer. Right? So, we, so we'd like to get your help on the survey. Um, what this will help us do is figure out, first off, what you're doing now, how many classes you're doing, what level. So we're trying to figure out do we have a need to have sort of beginning level and advanced level, and you know, what all do you need to, meet to, to, to help you all. Um, and so, um, how many of you think you might be interested in going to the PD Week next in July 18th? So here's the thing that's exciting. Owen Osterkamp, who is he's actually at Duke University, he's been involved with the CS Principles course from the very beginning, right? So we have an opportunity for, to, for all of you to go to a class that's actually sponsored by sort of the creators of the CS Principles. And Chuck's been sharing great information with us about what you've been doing in your classroom and how things have gone over, over the last few years. But this and get 
get some information you know, directly from the uh, horse's mouth, so to speak, right? So, so I'm hoping that many of you can participate in that. What our plan is to kind of capitalize on that, so we'll have people doing that workshop and then do our other workshops in addition to that. And so we're in the planning stages. And what this survey will do is help us plan because we're gonna be spending the spring semester doing lots of work with our grad students who will be supporting the project and you know, getting more feedback as we go along and giving you more information. But So the first step though is to really just get us this information via the survey. Um, notice that there are a couple of opportunities. There's the uh, Owen Ostrakan um, sir, uh, BD week that he's going to do in July. There's also the Oracle Academy, the which you know, Oracle being, of course, the close ties to Java. They're going to have more courses that are sort of at the Java level. So we also want to sort of be a conduit to, to funnel people who are ready for that into maybe some of the Oracle Academy classes as well. So the first step is for that, to, you know, to fill out that survey. Um, as part of that, as we go along, we will try to figure out sort of what the needs are in the community and how to support you both with these workshops in the, the summer and then the plan for cool. next uh, fall will be to have some undergrad good. students who can support you as Home well. Maybe even come to your class, do some guest lectures, maybe work with you externally, you know, on a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you know, as we have time, as time permits. So, so there's a lot of exciting things now that we've got the funding for that. So. Um, and the other thing Tracy wanted me to find out was what questions you have. And um, it's likely I won't be able to answer those questions, but I will at least take those questions back to Tracy so we can see what your concerns are. So does anybody have any questions or concerns right now with regards to C-START? How do we get to the survey? The uh, email, probably we will send out another uh, a copy of that survey because it's a link that's uh, it's under Google Forms MBZ one F F Y K. I don't really want to type it up there. So we will send that again. Chuck, do you have that email? Yeah, I'm just. It's on our website. Let me just get to that in a Perfect. second, and then. So yeah. if I hope so I Chuck can. just got our email, we'll be taking that. Yes. That out what we'll do is we'll send out another one. So if, assuming that Chuck now has everybody's email, we'll send out another another uh, email. My thing was just to sort of put in a plug and say, hey. I know everybody gets inundated with hundreds of surveys, and I tend to delete almost every link that says answer a survey just because I'm sort of weary of them. But it so, will help us. So. What? Yeah, so if you go to CSTA Colorado, and by the way, there's an old site that's being retired. If you get to the other one, right up at the top of that, there's a link to go to the new site. But if you get to the new site, one of the tabs is professional development. And in here, it has a link to that pre-apply survey, more about um, CSP Ad Week, and more about C Start there. Okay, and this is this is the pre-apply for the the CS Ed Week, but this survey here, this one, is the one that you should fill out if you want to be going to any of the C Start stuff. Okay, and that's what's going to help us do our planning for during the spring semester. Okay. And it's, uh, it's mostly, I mean, we're, we'll be focusing on things like the Intro CS and the CS Principles, which yeah. are sort of high school AP kinds of courses. Um, so some of the material might be suitable for an upper level middle school, but it's not really a middle school curriculum per se. So if you have questions about that, the best thing would be just send us an email and we can chat about what might, might work in your scenario. And now that we have the website up, Sue and I will try to get that more up to date. So there would be at least a reasonable chance you might be able to find something like that on the website when you look for it. And you can always email me and I'll chase it down or I'll put it up on the website if I've been slow about that. Um, so I, I guess, I'm sorry, did you, were you finished? I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay. So if you're doing anything for our code CS Ed Week that you want to share at some point, email that to me, send me some pictures, some examples. We can share that out on the website. We can talk about that later. If there's anything you're planning for that, that you think it'd be neat to share with everybody else right now, because it's an idea that nobody else has thought of yet, this would be a good time. Yeah. I wanted to put a question out there for, um, for people who have tried to do this for CS Ed Week before. 
when I asked my students what they wanted to do for CS Ed Week, one thing that they talked about was doing either a hackathon or a computer programming competition of some sort. Um, and these are new, new programmers. Like, they, they just started learning. And so I was racking my brain trying to figure out how you put together a programming competition for kids that have, are just learning it. But I think they'd get a lot out of it. And I was wondering if any of you guys have ever put on a, a coding competition for novice programmers for a hackathon. I have since 1972. <laughs> you want to do that? I, I would love to chat with you about ideas for what that would look like. I mean, I can run one for you. I've been all up and running. I have run, on a good year, I used to run 70 competitions. Yeah, that's hot. That'd be awesome. Okay. <laughs> I shall run maybe with you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to share right now about our codes, CS Ed Week? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, also, we put out there our code. You can click on that and go straight to our code. So that's a clickable picture. Yeah. Which is great. Yeah. Um, and then we also have a Boulder Valley rural action with our code. So what we're going to do with TSA, the first hundred people that participate in our code and bring that first certificate get a piece of pizza with us. And then that's at lunch. And then they have to have done it over that week and they can show it to us. And then the next hundred get some kind of piece. And so we're, we're upping it to 200 people. So that's a thing that you can do. And we're, we've advertised it. We have a little, you know, all kinds of stuff around the school. So that's something you can do. We, we did we did coding competitions a lot. And last year it was all the, the computer science kids who did it. So it's like that did a different purpose. <laughs> Great. So we want a bigger body. Yeah, I know. Um, we, my students aren't so wild about going to get the other students in their school to code, but they love to go to the middle school and the elementary school and be the coding hero when they go there. So we do that a lot too. Okay, uh, I just wanted to update you. There'll be more news about this. There was something called Compute Colorado. The Colorado Technology Association and the Colorado Education Initiative sponsored this last Thursday and Friday, brought in a lot of um, education representatives, state government representatives, and so on, just to take a, a good look at where we should be going with computer science, because I think people have taken notice that by far the biggest number of jobs for the foreseeable future in Colorado, just like in the nation, is going to be computer science. I mean, the numbers, depending on where you read them, sometimes they say it's around 30 percent. And uh, Colorado has a huge number of computer science professionals, but not graduating that many native computer scientists. And so um, just, a, just a whole lot of brainstorming ideas about where to go with that. There's a lot of industry people who really want to support that, who really want to put the effort into it. Uh, state government is interested in it too as well. Yes, Kyle? Yeah, I want to thank you guys. Um, when I lived down here in 1990, um, there were high schools in the Dallas area having more kids take AP computer science than our entire state. And the numbers have only gone up just in the last six or seven years in Colorado quite a bit. It's due to a lot of you guys offering AP computer science. I mean, I used to have like 20% of the students or more every year for my students, and I just thought that's pathetic because, I mean, we're a high-tech state, right? So thank you guys for doing that. Big difference. We're probably at close to 300 or 400 exams now. And it was just not too long ago, it was just, we didn't even break 100 for a long time. Good job. Um, I know a lot of people, speaking of that, do, are interested in getting going with the AP Computer Science Principles course. And I'm going to give you a little bit of insider information that's not on the record, but I just want to, I know some stuff has come out to the pilot teachers about what's coming down. And these aren't official dates on that have been released yet, but it looks likely. The probable timeline for AP Computer Science Principles, beginning about March, if you go into the College Board, um, the AP Audit site, you should be able to add AP Computer Science Principles to your audit account. And once you do that, then you can complete the course audit form. That's just to fill in the blank things. And uh, your principal needs to approve that. But then you can submit a syllabus for the 2016-17 school year. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to do this. There is a framework that you can follow. There are many, many good 
curriculum projects, if you want to go with the curriculum project, that can form the core of your syllabus, but it's probably coming up, like I said, March or so. And the other thing I want to let you know, I found this out just the other day, that it, it's really slow process sometimes for College Board to, or for anybody to release a new course name that Colorado accepts and then puts on the books and then districts accept and put on the books. And if you're not in a district or private school, you might have a little bit more flexibility, but I think still people look at those Colorado course code numbers. So those have been released. And as far as I know, my course schedule at my high school has told me that here's what the numbers are. And there are two numbers because it's two semesters. It is titled AP Computer Science Principles, and it has a description that goes with it, just like any other courses in the Colorado course catalog do. So it is available. So if you're in a school district, you want to be putting that in your registration guide this spring for next fall. Where you find those numbers? Because that's what I had issues finding. Well, okay, I, I don't know the simple answer to that. Somebody in your building should know somebody in your district who can talk, contact somebody in the state to do it. But it's my understanding that these are all Colorado course co catalog numbers. So if you look at the agenda that I have and I shared with you, and you take those numbers to your whoever your AP, your assistant principal who schedules or things like that and say, I think these are the numbers for the course. Can you check on it and see if we can get those added for next year? Okay. So I can't promise that all that stuff will go through smoothly, but that's my understanding right now. Yes, Sue? So these are the course numbers. I'm sorry, I'm asking part. They're, they come from where? Well, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so like in, in most districts, like in my district, Jeffco can't put a course out there for schools to use until they've gotten it from the CDE's official course list. Okay. Okay. And some people maybe don't have as rigid of a hierarchy as Jeffco does, but at any rate, um, there should be a way for anybody to approach it now. Well, as a pilot course, I've just been running it for two years under another approved course title called Computer Programming Advanced is what I have been doing, but next year I can still do that. Okay. And if you have any questions on that that you think I can help you with, that I might have an inside track as a pilot teacher, first of all, I might not. But if I can, I'll try to find out for you. So be sure and let me know if you have questions, OK? All right. So um, we want to take a look at block-based languages here in the remaining time that we have. Oh, I'm sorry. I do need to back up one more thing to tell you this. Um, let's see. Where is this? Oh. Okay, got a couple things. Okay, um, we have a form that I would really like you to use and just fill in the stuff so we know you attended tonight. If you go to tinyurl.com slash FRCSTA, like Front Range Computer Science Teachers Association hyphen info, if you would just fill that out, it's nice to have kind of a record of who's here. And I will tell you one of the first things on there says, What's your CSTA member number? And remember, it doesn't cost you anything to be in the Computer Science Teachers Association. Okay? So it's like, if you don't have some strong principled reason for not becoming a member of anything ever, I would suggest if you don't have a member number, there's a link on that form that you can get one. You can fill it out and get it within a few minutes. Also, if you forgot what your member number is because you, know, you probably don't use it as often as your credit card pin. But you can look that up. There's a link to do that too. And if you would just please fill that out for me. And if you just can't get to it tonight because there's just too much excitement between the Arduinos and between whatever has been shared with you about block languages, well, then do it when you get home or something like that. I would really appreciate that, OK? And so uh, before we sure. jump in, yes? Yeah, one thing I forgot to say. Uh, we do have a poster session where our grad students are going to be presenting their work. And, and Chuck's been kind of asking, and some of the others have, how can you find out more about sort of what graduate programs look like and what cool research is being done, at least at Mines? And that would be January 21st. 
and so if you just want to kind of make a note of the date, we'll send more information, I'm sure, via the list, but that was the second topic okay. you wanted so to January get. January 21st, mention, so. and we'll put it on the website and we'll send out email about it. Okay. So, Stephanie, if this would be a good time for you to tell us a little bit about textiles. It sure. ties in well with the hands-on stuff we've been doing. And then after that, we will go into some block programming languages. I'll bring that. Hi, so I'm Stephanie Weber from the National Center for Women and Information Technology, SUS. And we work, worked with SparkFun as well as MIT um, to come up with a e-textiles program that uses the Arduino language. And e-textiles, I'm going to show you a little video, I think, um, of what e-textiles is. This is a program that uh, is geared toward middle school, but I think could be applicable for high school, especially if you um, tailor make the, the monster that lights up and sings that would be something more um, appealing to high school students. So the goal was to attract um, women and other underrepresented groups to computer science by using crafting um, and an art to get them involved in computing. So I'm going to have Brian show you this little video which kind of introduces what eTextiles is. This card, by the way, gives you a little a description of the content. It's downloadable and free. It gives you a material list for everything that you would need to get um, in order to do this project. Welcome to eTextiles. In the workshop ahead, you will learn electronics and computing as you make adorable, or fierce, monsters that light up and sing. To make a monster, you will use little electronic and computer components like these. The bigger piece is a computer microcontroller. The two smaller round ones are tiny speakers. The oval components are very low powered lights called LEDs. E-textiles, or electronic textiles, are what you get when you combine fabric with small devices powered by electricity and controlled by tiny computers. You decide how the parts come together and how they behave. Here is one girl's monster owl. She made its wings sensitive. When she pinches them, the eyes light up. She also programmed her owl to play a song that she composed. E-textiles can get pretty wild. This laser dress lit up a fashion show in London. E-textiles are fabrics with embedded electronics including sensors, lights, motors, and small computers. This is Leah Beakley, the computer scientist who designed the e-textiles projects you will be doing in the workshop. She designed this bike jacket too. Not only is it cool, it keeps her safe on her bike. Can you tell how? If you guess that the arrow is signaling a left turn, you were right. When she's riding down the street, she can let cars and other bikes know when she's turning left or right. This is just one e-textiles creation. The possibilities are endless. Today, we hope to inspire you and start you on your way. Before we explain your e-textiles projects, let's step back and learn about the history of wearable electronics. You might say e-textiles started with electricity itself. In the late 1800s, people were just getting electricity in their homes. A lamp with an electric bulb was a big deal. Can you imagine? It was back then that designers and engineers started playfully combining electricity with clothing and jewelry. Here's a picture of Alice Vanderbilt dressed up for a fancy ball as an electric light. Fast forward to 1968 and the Museum of Contemporary Craft in New York City held an exhibition called Body Covering that showed how technology and clothing could come together. The show featured astronaut spacesuits along with clothing that could inflate and deflate, light up, and even heat and cool itself. This designer, Diana Dew created an entire line of electronic fashion, including light-up party dresses and belts that can sound alarm sirens. In the 1990s, e-textiles really got going. Scientists at MIT began exploring how electronics and computers could be gracefully incorporated into clothing. This galaxy dress comes complete with 24,000 full-color LED lights. Each light is as flat as paper and about as big around as a pea. The dress can be programmed to display everything from abstract patterns to video. What video would you play on a dress like this? The circuits, the connections between the LED lights, are designed so the fabric of the dress still stretches and remains flexible. The lights consume surprisingly little energy. How much, you ask? The dress can run for 30 minutes to an hour on a few iPod batteries. Adidas took a different approach to e-textiles, using computers to create personal monitoring systems. 
This shirt has several bands of conductive thread knitted into it, so a heart rate monitor becomes part of the shirt. E-textiles aren't just for high fashion and sports companies anymore. Now a series of do-it-yourself toolkits and books are available, so anyone can design and build e-textiles. Let's talk about your projects. You will use parts like these for e-textiles. See the needle and thread? This is special thread that conducts electricity. You will use it to stitch parts together and create electronic circuits. The large piece is the LilyPad Arduino microprocessor. It's a little computer. The others are small bits that light up, make sound, vibrate, or even sense the temperature. You'll learn more about these later. Here's an example of a dress built with the LilyPad Arduino. It's not only beautiful, but functional. This dress can sense levels of pollution in the air. Think about the kind of fashion you could create. Let's watch a short video of some projects that were created using the LilyPad Arduino kit. She works here now. and the LilyPad Arduino. The eTextiles project will consist of three different lessons. The first project will introduce you to simple electronic circuits and sewing with conductive thread to produce an electronic bookmark. In the second project, you will learn computer programming or coding. You will use a computer connected to the LilyPad Arduino microprocessor and write a computer program that tells the microprocessor what to do. Your program will tell the microprocessor how to control little LEDs so they light up in the pattern you choose. Have you heard of programming languages? 
Python, Ruby, C++, Java, and BASIC are just a few languages you might come across. Once you learn one language, it's not hard to learn another. In this project, you will learn to program in Arduino. You will use the same skills you learn in the programming activity when you make your monster. In the final project, you will combine your knowledge of simple circuits, programming, and sewing to create the monster of your dreams. This cute little guy will not only light up, but sing you a song. Want to create more with e-textiles? You can! There are lots of resources out there to not only inspire you, but to help you find the supplies you need. If you want to learn more, check out these three excellent do-it-yourself books, which are full of fun e-textile projects, including light-up accessories, headphones, and smartphone gloves. You can find these titles on Amazon.com. You may have time during the e-textile session or at home to try some other computer programming activities. We suggest you visit www.code.org and try Scratch, Code Academy, Khan Academy, or Code HS. This programming project is from Code HS. In it, you learn programming to control Corel the dog and his yellow ball. E-textiles might be your very first experience in computer science. There are a million places computer science can take you. Have fun with e-textiles, and who knows, it might be your first step down a very interesting path into computing. Have fun! So that video was the first sort of a thing to show students. Um, this program is completely downloadable for free off the website. And um, it is, the important thing to know is it is for instructors, so it's not student facing. It's facing for you to learn you know, to the Arduino program and how to code and how to, if you have never sewn before um, or done any of those crafting type things, um, it goes through it. So it's a teacher facing material for you to then be the person to go and teach your students about Arduino and crafting any textiles. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, and you know, hopefully somebody will go check it out. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thanks. If you want to see a few of the examples of the plush monsters, we have a we have a set of them in our office. We can pull those out later if you want to see them. Are we? We're ready to talk about blocks. Do you want to plug in? Do you have a, yes. Are you HDMI compatible? Yeah. Down to my very soul. Uh, I thought you had like a new. Yeah, it's out for a pair. <laughs> oh, second time. So Ben's going to give us an overview, and then we're going to hear about RG Block from Brian, about Scratch from Sue and Tony, and about Agent Sheets from Fred. Hey, everybody. So um, as I mentioned before, I'm Ben. I work at CU. And uh, my thought for tonight was just to give you like a five-minute overview of What's the deal with blocks-based programming languages, since many of you have seen them or used them or are curious about them? Um, so I'm going to just give you a really quick definition, talk about what they do and what they don't do, and talk about some interesting questions that I'm sure you're going to have over the next few years if you haven't already. So what are blocks? How many of you have seen things that look like this? OK, so about 2 thirds of you. So blocks are visual representations of program code that add shape and color to concrete syntax. So instead of just text, typically you get text plus some shape and color to the things. I'm going to show some examples. This is an example of an event handler from our computer music system that we've built for kids. Um, so it has physical hardware. So this says that when someone presses the button on port 1, play this drum sequence. So mostly you get a lot of bass drum, which some kids like. Um, just to give you a simpler example, um, this is from one of the code.org Blockly maze tutorials. So you can see little visual elements corresponding to different programming language elements. So see the little divot on the top and then the little sticky outy bit on the bottom. Um, those indicate how this block could be connected with other blocks. So they sort of fit together like puzzle pieces, which gives you a sense of how to connect to them. We can also see uh, these slots over here, which are where we're expected to put in other code, and a drop down here where we can um, adjust a required parameter. Um, so that's great, but what do blocks do for learners and what they, don't they do for learners? Because they're not a silver bullet, OK? So, May, more and more programming tools are using blocks. 
for programming on the screen, physical computing. We're going to see some tonight. Um, and more and more educators and kids use them and like them. I like them. And the reason people like them is they scaffold some of the hard aspects of programming, but they don't do everything. So one of the things that they do is they can give you hints about syntax and about type compatibility. So I made this screenshot earlier. Uh, this if block expects a Boolean over here. So if I drag this true over, which is a Boolean type, um, the little receptacle will start to glow to let me know that they're compatible. Um, if I drag something else there, like this, um, the square root of a number is also a number. It's not a Boolean. So the little receptacle here, I don't know what to call it, a connector, doesn't glow. So really quickly, kids can get some feedback about whether things are type compatible while they're programming. Um, Blocks can also prevent syntax errors. So this is a screenshot from Pencil Code. So they've got a nice module for writing HTML with blocks. It makes it impossible to do the pretty common syntax error of having an opening tag but not a closing tag. I'm sure you've all seen kids do I see nods. Yeah, so, so blocks is a nice example. You can't make a syntax error. That's the number one win of blocks, OK? Um, they also can aid discovery of possibilities within programming environments. So this is a screenshot from Alice, which is one of the very first blocks-based languages. So when you're exploring an environment like this, or any programming environment, it's like, how do you know what the methods you can call are? How do you know what the objects that are in scope are? Things like this. Um, because you can't type in code, you have to have a place to drag it from. And that gives you the nice benefit of you can scroll through and see all the different things that are available to you. So they help learners avoid some kinds of errors. They help them write correct code in some ways. And they also help them discover possibilities within programming environments. There's other things that are pretty cool. Um, tools like Scratch can give you some ability to visually trace your program. So as a program is running, you can see code highlight as it runs. You can also click on code and execute individual statements or blocks. Um, there's also some really cool work. Um, this is some of Mike Horn and Marina Bears' work on making wooden blocks that fit together, just like the on-screen ones, which have been really successful with very young children who maybe aren't really ready for a lot of screen time. But uh, making things out of physical blocks and then having a camera read them and make a robot move around, things like that, which I think is pretty cool. Um, as I mentioned, they're not a silver bullet. Blocks are structured editors for program text that can provide help with concrete syntax. Um, but they don't necessarily help or say anything about what the language program programming paradigm is or what the runtime behavior of the system is going to be. And there's a whole variety of blocks-based environments out there. Um, so they don't help with most of the things that are hard about programming. So they help with some of the syntax stuff, a little bit of type stuff. But they don't, for example, help you to think about algorithms or usually even to visualize what's happening in algorithms. Um, and block languages that look identical visually can have really different semantics. So um, here's an example. At the top is code from scratch. And at the bottom is identical code from our blocks-based programming environment. So both of them define two event handlers. They respond to different inputs. They have the exact same logic for how to change the variable foo and to do something in response to the value of the variable foo. But they actually mean different things. So in Scratch, event handlers run in parallel. So there's actually room for a race condition in that top one, where if both buttons are hit at the same time, you can actually get surprising behavior, because stuff running over here can happen in between this change and this if which can be really hard to reason about. Um, whereas we don't do that. We queue up event handlers to prevent that kind of bug in students' code. So the block languages can look the same, but actually have some pretty different semantics, which is important. Um, and actually, one study of kids' Scratch programs found that they really frequently had these kind of race conditions, and it's very hard to fix them in Scratch. Um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you're going to see some block-based stuff for Arduino. And one of the things that's really hard for a lot of learners about Arduino is dealing with multiple inputs and outputs at the same time. You want kind of an asynchronous or parallel environment. And it's really hard to get that Arduino, and the blocks don't help with that. So that's a place where we need better tools, which is actually a research area in my lab. Last slide. Um, there's some interesting research going on right now. And I hear amazing things from teachers about these kinds of things all the time, too. So. Um, blocks do change the ways that kids look at program code, reason about it, look for bugs in it. 
Um, Hillary Dwyer has done some nice research on this. She's moving to Boulder in February, so hopefully we'll be able to give her a nice warm welcome then. Um, we don't know a ton about how kids can transition from block space languages into textual languages, although there's some nice work happening with Greenfoot and that ecology of tools. What's uh, uh, Greenfoot is a sort of introductory IDE for programming in Java. Um, I'm sh is there anybody in the room who teaches with Greenfoot? Okay, so maybe after, that would be a good conversation to have. Um, we also don't know a lot about how kids transition from the kind of walled garden of a lot of these blocks environments to more open-ended things like, you know, okay, now you've got the whole Python universe available to you. Ah, what do you do? We don't know a lot about that. We also don't know a lot about how to make blocks environments accessible for people with disabilities. So they tend not to work well with screen readers. They tend to not work well for people who have motor impairment. So often blocks require a lot of really fine-grained motor control, which is hard for some kids. So there's also, I think, some interesting future work to be done there that hopefully you all could get involved with. Um, that's all I got. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so we've been building a toolkit called Blocky Talky, which is designed to make it easy for kids to build physical computing things that are networked. So we've got kids building stuff ranging from robotics things to Internet of Things type devices, um, networked computer music systems, all kinds of stuff. I'd be happy to talk about it at a future meeting. Yep. Um, are you starting to work with kids with disabilities? Because a couple of us have done that. And um, Scratch and certainly Alice, if you yeah. were, that I started using to modify for kids with yeah. severe disabilities, and I can actually do something. I've actually had four or five every semester in my class. Awesome. Yeah. It's a great, that's a great illustration. Very cool. Thanks. I'd love to hear about that. Other comments, ideas to share? Sorry, my students are texting me in the background. <laughs> that's what that sound is. Yeah. The Alice they were actually doing for a while, they tried the pure Alice and they didn't kind of pair Alice to Alice Java. And text at the same time because they saw yep. they didn't see the transition yeah. from one to the other. It's still an open ended question of how that's yeah. going to happen. Yep. Um, David Weintraub has been doing some really cool work with teachers and students in Chicago on this. And the kids often have really sophisticated ideas about like why learn stuff in blocks, why learn things in text. And the kids, a lot of kids who really want to go into computing want to skip blocks because they want to do something that looks like real programming to them. But the kids, but often they also recognize that they might learn better with a simpler environment. And so he's actually seeing kids make pretty sophisticated choices about how to navigate these kinds of systems, which is pretty interesting. Um, happy to introduce any of you who are curious about that work. Great, thank you all very much. I'm next? Oh, wow. All right. Um, so hopefully you guys got a good feel of the sandbox and some things you can do with it. Um, when we first released this, our target audience was going to be the elementary slash middle school age group. We thought that, you know, this kind of style of, of syntactical programming where case makes a difference, uh, parentheses, open and close, curly braces, um, all those things would be difficult for students to jump into. Um, and so we wanted to make this thing that was pre-wired, ready to go, and then also had a block-based engine into it. So um, on our website for this product, it was actually released with um, a bunch of tutorials using ArduBlock. I mean, ArduBlock is a graphical programming environment. Oh, this is I wonder why it's pulling this up. But um, I'll show you just briefly how to do kind of the same thing we just did with the kind of same idea here. Um, so like Ben was saying that you, it has these, these things where you can kind of get this relation, relational understanding of how things click together. I can say I want this to be pin four, and then I'm going to put a delay uh, which is under control, and let's see. So the delay goes here. Some fun things, right? So I can clone 
right? Just like I try to encourage my students to understand the idea of copy paste. I think when we teach English or other classes, we try to discourage that. We call it plagiarism. Um, <laughs> but in programming, there's a lot of rep repetitions. So things like this, right? So that's that same kind of blink code in blocks. Um, and it was written by a gentleman, David Lee, in, uh, in Shanghai. And uh, he did this on his free time, on his side, because he wanted to teach his, I think at the time, like eight-year-old daughter how to program. He was a programmer coder, and he wanted to do this. And uh, this is created using what's called the Open Blocks framework. Again, all this stuff is built off of the open source kind of ecosystem. A lot of the stuff that the blocky talky kind of stuff is built off of um, is the direction where a lot of these things are going towards. Um, there is, I can show you guys one additional Alternative. This is actually totally unreleased. I was told by the developers not to share it with anybody. <laughs> but I know, right? So don't tell me secrets. <laughs> don't ever share this. So um, blockly.codebender.cc, um, you can kind of get a feel for what it looks like. It's not fully working yet. So um, you can, this is basically using some of the same kind of frameworks. Um, that are in, uh, in the, the blocky kind of system here. Um, and it's using a programming environment called CodeBender, which programs in the web browser. Um, if any of your schools are using Chromebooks, CodeBender, if you go to just codebender.cc, you can use the CodeBender IDE. I'll just show it to you guys. Um, and they say like, oh, so yeah, the largest Arduino playground in the world. Uh, Right? Um, but basically, it allows you to do all the stuff out of your web browser. It does require, like Google Docs does, a good, strong internet connection in the background here. Um, but they are building, they understand the need for a block-based language. So they're um, trying to work on this. They're also, like many of these startups, they are venture capitalist funded. So they've got all this money to burn right now and trying to figure out, uh, all right, we're providing these products for free. How do we make money? Uh, but in the meantime, we can capitalize and use these things because it's currently free and um, kind of a neat thing to play with. So when we do this, uh, let me just show, I don't know how you do this, math maybe? How do I put in a number? There it is. So I can drop this in here. I'll change that to uh, four. And then I think if I click on the Arduino here, it shows me the Arduino code. You can, the, the, the old way of doing it is to just copy this and then paste it into your Arduino window and click upload, which is the students still see the code, right? They don't have to worry about syntax and commas and funny uh, semicolons, they can, but they can still see it. They do have to do that one task of copy paste. Um, this still, the programmer part isn't fully running yet on this, but. Uh, you could, right, right. So it doesn't have any correction because you left off numbers and then I left off numbers. Right, right. So if you're using CodeBender on a Chromebook, can you communicate with an Arduino board from a Chromebook? Yes. Yes, so CodeBender has a, uh, has, um, has an extension. It's a plug-in that, that sits on top of Chrome um, that will allow you to communicate to hardware devices. Um, and they got it all approved and vetted by the App Store wherever the equivalent is on the Google side of the App Store. Uh, yes, yep. So the sandbox is on there as well. Um, the last thing that, I don't know, before I fully turn over everything to uh, the rest of the meeting, that is on the end of your little handout here. Um, and I'm just really proud of this. I didn't build it or do much of anything except for just suggest that it be built. <laughs> Um, but some good friends of mine, um, th there's some good friends of mine here in Boulder, they started a company called Bitsbox. Um, if you've never played with Bitsbox, it's a spectacular, phenomenal platform of learning to program JavaScript. But they created this, uh, they helped us create this hour of code thing. So if you go to sparkfun.com slash hour of code, it's actually a redirect. We were going to port everything to our own servers, but we still haven't, so it still goes to their old site, which used to be called Code Pops. Um, but this is a virtual, um, it's a virtual digital sandbox. So here's the code. I click Run Code. 
and you got a blinking LED, and I've got the slider works. This is all the stuff that I guess um, web developers are all very familiar with these JavaScript things. I don't fully understand any of this. But um, when you hover over the light sensor, it's like a little flashlight. I hover over the microphone, it becomes a sound sensor. The sun over the thing. Um, it really only, it's not fully tested on all systems. It works really well in Chrome, or it did when we released it. <laughs> Um, they have been very kind to help us build this. Um, they are now in startup mode, trying to make sure that they keep the lights on, um, but they're doing very, very well, um, the folks at, at Bitsbox. But this is a neat platform. If you want to just play with the sandbox or the idea of Arduino without having to buy an Arduino, um, this is a great way to do it. So can you slide the slider and switch the switch? Yep, yep. So. In the very first example, I think, you know, I threw some like really bad, poorly written code here that does everything, right? So, um, oh, maybe not that one. One of them, anyway. One of them, I think I wrote um, an example that has like you can click on now all the things and play with them. But in um, the last, so the last little dot here is an empty. I call it the sandbox, the digital sandbox sandbox, right? So this is where you just have an empty programming window. And you can type in your code here, right? Oh, uh, sparkfun.com slash hour of code. And it's, 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 a, it's the very last page on here. Um, and there's just some fun activities here. I think a lot of these, I really just assume that you guys, as, as computer science teachers, know some general syntax stuff. You just want to see some examples. Um, but this is a resource that all of these code examples should work, should work on this platform. Um, but so cool. You're gonna help <laughs> Kevin continue to maintain that simulator, aren't you? Um, I'm I'm kind of embarrassed to say this. I we offered to pay them for their work. And they got so caught up in starting up their company, Bitsbox, that they we never ever did an exchange of money. And so I feel really bad. So I, I mean, I love what they've done with Bitsbox, and so I continue to promote theirs as well. And I hope that that, as a minimum, kind of repays them for uh, for the work that they did. Um, but Scott threw that together in a weekend. Uh, I don't. Yeah. So. Cool. Do we want to talk about Scratch? Hey, Ben, do you yeah. know, are people, is anybody researching into the fact that when you have languages that run side by side, like Brian was just showing us the yeah. block and the text view, or yeah. pencil code the block yeah. and text view? Yeah, so, do you, mean, do you guys uh, want to plug in? David Weinstein, yeah, yeah. 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 yes. Do you have HDMI? Yeah. I have my own. It's just to be That's HDMI. Oh, shoot. This code is actually yeah, taken mostly of the code. It's down to some small Yeah, I, I need the to go so yeah, ad ad adapter. Yeah. We can yeah. ask our, our uh, two people. <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, yeah, actually, you're, this semester, I mean, you know, because they're going into the, the block type languages and I use Scratch. I'm, st I'm actually just still getting back reacquainted with because it's been about three or four years since I used it. So, and we, with the CS principles and everything, I'm hearing more about it. So, the, my Java class that is kind of modeled after, you know, CS principles uh, pilot courses. I, I had um, I use processing and and then kind of go into Java. But I was having I was some of the kids were struggling and I thought, you know. I want to go see what if I could use Scratch, and so I had, got them start with Scratch, and then I have the rights a, a program in Scratch, and then I have them convert it to Java. So, you know, the the Scratch is kind of like a prototype, you know, a prototyping language or something like that, and it, I think it helps them visualize what's going on with the code, and then they can easily kind of. Oh, Another reason to learn Scratch is that it's the base of App Inventor, so you can develop apps with it. So I do that in my classes a lot. We're just starting that right now.
Pretty much what you always get. Anyway, so hopefully. Oh yeah, and I was also in my AP class too. I was going to use Scratch to um, kind of like it, it. It works with lists and stuff like that. You know, sometimes when you're adding things to a list and you go to delete something from a list, and if it's not right, your your amount of items in lists. If you have a, another number that's keeping track of that changes, and then the students don't re realize that, and, and the pearls up. Uh, Scratch kind of has a good way of handling lists. I thought that might be a good way too to have them experiment and get a better understanding of, of the list. Was oh, that mine? Maybe I need to mirror it. Yeah, I, I, we, there's just a few slides, and we'll kind of do more of a demo. But this is just, um, like I said before, I was using Scratch a few years ago, and it was something you downloaded um, for Windows or Macs. And the desktop application, I think, runs better than the online ones. But they're getting closer to it, and it's just easier to use a web based tool when you don't have to install it all a bunch of computers, and I didn't really have time. So I've been using um, the Scratch MIT. That edu one and it's probably one of the more straightforward I think um, so anyway if you go to the site you can kind of like uh, do a couple things here like it says try it out um, and then the other thing here I guess I'll skip around if you go to see examples it'll show you how to get started with one we'll kind of go through a couple of these in a second but um, and then you can once you want to join it you, you, you create an account and the other good thing is it's, it allows the students to store the stuff on their website or whatever so they can save things. So that's the benefit of signing in or creating an account. Um, yeah, I'll go into this in a second. Uh, and the other thing is uh, if, uh, which there's probably a link on there, but I wasn't sure how to get to. If you click on the tips uh, on the this side over here, there's a whole bunch of little tutorials that kind of lead you through step by step. So. Um, when I wanted to jump back into this, I wasn't super prepared with a, a detailed tutorial, so I just had the kids, uh, the students, do a few of these to get them used to doing. It, kind of, kind of explain it as it went as it went along. So, just remember the tips will show you. It actually is like a little window that slides over that you can see, and um, this is one of the first pilots a long time ago, well, about three or four years ago. I got from here some of my uh, scratch scratch stuff, and it's. They've actually updated for the um, um, CS principles, so there's a pretty good. It's called the Joy of Computing. It has a whole, the whole um, everything you need to do for C, uh, CS principles is in here, uh, but it uses mostly um, Scratch, and it uses the Snap version of it, which used to be Build Your Own Blocks or something like that. I think it was. Yeah, B-O, yeah, B, and, and that was, I guess, it's pretty much the same, that was, again, I used the desktop one, the online version has a couple little things that don't work, I think one of them is the, uh, I'll create a list, you can kind of get around with it and, and do it, but, um, so, and here's this kind of, it looks a little bit different, if you use, I'm kind of using both of them, actually in my AP class I'm using this version of it, because um, it, it does a little more. Uh, but it's a little hard to use. So, anyway, so those are some of the slides. But if we jump into what I have here, um, yeah, just recently, for uh, kind of not very much space here, but um, <clears throat> we ran, we uh, had the students do this. I gave them some starter code for this, but I kind of took some pieces away from it. But um, it's a, it drops pieces of candy. You're supposed to catch it with the catch you with the, while you're shooting the witch, I don't know. Um, and then there's some things like if you hit the, if you, if you get the clock, it'll, uh, which I just missed it, it'll give you more time and all that. So kind of the object is get the, is to get the clock, you get more time, you get more, more, uh, more play time. And if you get the witch, I if you kill the witch, I think you get more time too. Anyway, um, but better stop, that's annoying. Yeah, and it, the cool thing with Scratch is how it has a lot of sounds and things, but it gets to be really annoying around the kids. 
All right, but like they're saying, they, they have all these different blocks that we've been talking about. Um, if I can scoot this over. So, uh, and they're all color coded, so you can do like the motion and um, the looks where you want to, if you want to say something or switch costumes, you have costumes you can use. The sound here, um, you can also, I had actually one kid, he played uh, Old McDonald. Well, that was annoying. But he went through the whole thing and did it. So, and then he had to speed up and slow down. That was kind of cool. And then the pen, you can actually drop and drop, uh, have the pen draw as it's moving around. Um, the data is where you can create uh, variables and also make lists or like arrays. Uh, the events are kind of more like like um, getting things started or if something an event happens like a um, either space. So you can pull this down, have any different types of keys that are entered. Um, and there's something interesting down here. I just learned it can uh, as far as being object oriented or whatever, it, it can set, um, you know, we have these down here, all these sprites down here that you can use, and you can actually send messages back and forth to the different sprites, so if you want, if they are waiting to hear something and they hear something, they, then they can do something. So that's something pretty neat that I just learned. Um, control, you know, these are the typical um, kind of loop type of things, conditional things. Uh, the sensing a lot of times in games, which is difficult, is when two objects collide with one another. Um, there's this thing called touch, and so you can figure that out uh, along with some other things. Operators, this is where if you want to do some, you know, operate or addition, subtraction, multiplication, that kind of thing, you can get random numbers. Uh, this section here is you how you do the greater or comparisons um, if you want to do and or stuff or not. Uh, join if you want to add a lot of things together. You can you can kind of do that kind of with uh, strings and job. You can kind of, uh, and then you can actually create more blocks that you can call. And there's some limitations with that that I'm having to work with now. But um, so uh, yeah, one of the examples I think Sue wanted me to show you is this. Um, Animate the crab, you want to do that one? Yeah, I was just, yeah, let me, what I wanted to show you guys was a couple of things, but um, when I started teaching computer science 11 years ago, um, coming out of software engineering, I had to kind of figure out how to adapt what I knew to teaching high school, so um, I don't want to start from here, I want to start from the main menu, so how do I go back? Oh, I don't use Macs, excuse me. <laughs> So, so can you just go back to the, uh, just go back to scratch, thank you. So what I wanted to show you was if you go to explore, um, uh, see examples, so a good place for them to start, certainly you need to understand all the commands, but a good place to start, and they sort of, you'll have kids that certainly get an overview quickly and they can understand what you're talking about. So animate the crab is kind of a fun one because it's one sprite and it kind of shows the movement. Um, and if you come over here quickly, you should, where is it? Um, you have to go over and you can s press C inside and it shows the command. So it kind of shows you how you created the sprite and the movement. Um, so if I go back and what Tony was talking about, they can kind of go through and everything's color coded as you were talking about, Ben. So we have things that are color coded. So I know that this gold one is control. This gold one is event, data, et cetera. Purple is looks and you know, that kind of thing. The kids really get into the way things look and sound. So um, I, I guess it doesn't annoy me that much. So I, I enjoy a noisy classroom, so I'm okay. So if, if, if you press the green flag, it moves around. So it kind of shows you what it does. And they get some idea before they ever start using Scratch and they have some idea. And then when you go through the different commands, they have a little more fun with it. Okay, they, so you can go through, you can have them go through the different examples. So, um, I've used it off and on for, they, they started this project in 2003 and it's been around quite a while and I started using it about 2007 so 
Um, it's been real successful in my classroom. And you don't use it that long. How long do you say you use Scratch? Oh, just for a few, for yeah. a few weeks. A few so. weeks. It's real short. I mean, I wouldn't, I've heard people say, I'm trying to adapt it for the semester. It's a lie. You know, it doesn't last that long, people. So. <laughs> and I, I, at least in my experience, the, the girls mm -hmm. seem to enjoy this more. I, you know, sometimes, I don't know, they, they, they get more, say they get more gender. creative sometimes. Yeah. Like it and oh, I, yeah, they, you can they do, do a lot, do a lot of, of some of the recursive stuff, you know, like oh, a tree yeah, and stuff like that, that I've used it for in my advanced classes just to kind of explain the process and, and such, so. Okay, so um, I think there could be so many questions about this, so it might be fun to come back in and do some block-based programming some, at some meeting. So. Yeah, like maybe in the summer or maybe a lot when we have like maybe a day or something and maybe have sessions of teaching this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> So. Does anybody have any questions? I know you were kind of times. You ready? Ready to up? Do you want to use my computer? Or? Do I have to? Can I just do this? Yeah. Is there a USB on this one? Uh, there it is. Yep. Okay. It's on that. Oops. need to get the chrome the oh, there we go right there yeah, there was right. oh you think you might have just closed it okay i'll just bring it up here okay okay so it i think the agenda says i'm going to talk about agent sheets and agent cubes it's really um that's a company and they make two different kinds of software. One's a two-dimensional and the other's a three-dimensional. They call it game design software. It's really science simulation software. Um, but we hook the kids saying they can make games. So they make, you know, Pac-Man and Space Invaders. And then we try to get them to think about using the same tools to make simulations of, for example, a predator-prey model or the spread of a disease. If you want to play with it, if you go to csedweek.us, Is it doing this to me? Let's see. That's the hour of code site. It's Agent Cubes Online. So there's an online version. There's also downloadable versions that run on the computer. And if you scroll down and say create your own game, it'll take you to a site that has about a 45 minute video which you can, it's got chapters and everything. I'm gonna stop it right now. And it, it takes you through entire instruction of how to build a game of Frogger. And if you were to build Frogger in something like Scratch or Python, you're talking about hundreds to thousands of instructions. You could do the whole thing in maybe 20, including all of the turtles and the logs and the river and the reaching the gold and all that kind of stuff with the sound and all that kind of stuff. So. What, what, it, what we use it for is to get students to think about computational thinking and solving problems without having to get into the syntax language. And it was, people were referring to it as block-based. Well, it's not really block-based. Um, it's more rule-based. So let me close this and let me go to, uh, I just got links on my, Oh, uh, no, don't do that. Okay, so examples of things that you can do. So I've got a ton of different projects. So, for example, uh, you know, here's a little auto maze game. And you can play it or you can design it or you can edit it. 
in play mode, it just comes up and all you can do is, is do whatever the program allows you to play. Design lets you change the configuration without the code and edit lets you share the code. So um, the code is, this is everything in the entire programming language. It's all rule based. So if I click on the auto, these are the rules that govern the behavior of the auto, okay? So this auto, it's got a couple of modes. One is to let me drive the auto down the road. Of course, if I try to go off, oh, sorry. Um, it, it's, it's keeping track, whoop. It's keeping track of my mistakes as well as the time. And then when I finally get to the end, that's my favorite winning sound. Um, but there is a way to say, you know what, I'd like this to, Oh, I wish I brought my glasses up here. Where does anybody see about run mode here? Auto mode. Okay, there it is. So I'm going to set this to one. And what this is going to use is diffusion and hill climbing. So it's going to use artificial intelligence to have the auto. Oh, let me just, I have it going at every, every half a second. It's going to find its own way. And it's not finding it by looking at the road. It's finding by it's finding it by sensing the basically the distribution of a scent along the road. So the road is actually spreading a scent like water spreading the scent of your blood in in, in a pool, and it's using hill climbing to find the, the steepest slope. So for example, if I uh, make the game of Pac-Man, okay, if I make the game of Pac-Man, most people. A lot of people play Pac-Man. Most people don't realize the original Pac-Man, those, those ghosts really chased you. They don't chase you. The original Pac-Man, there's a guy that could play all 24 levels blindfolded because the ghosts have a predetermined pattern. Ms. Pac-Man, though, used artificial intelligence. You can't play that game with Ms. Pac-Man. Well, if you want to make Pac-Man, you need an artificial intelligence scheme. Now, they use a geometric one. We use more of a thermodynamic kind of thing. But I can teach the students with two instructions the concept of diffusion and hill climbing. Now, if they would like to go and learn a lot more about programming and physics, they can delve into it. But I can get them thinking about what does chasing mean and how do I implement it without having to get into the syntax. And I can go look at the syntax if I want. I think this one lets me show the JavaScript there. So I can go look at, you know, what's going on under the hood if I want. And so you can see, you can show the students what they might be getting into when they want to get into more programming. but um, what I want to do is help them build something, a fairly sophisticated one. For example, I work with a volunteer at Temple Grandin School, which is a school for autistic kids. And in the science class, oh, can somebody help me find you? Oh, there it is, Yellowstone. So in, in the science class, we wanted to model a predator prey. And, and the, the, the teacher wanted to teach what was it like when we introduced, why did we introduce wolves into Yellowstone? And what was it like and what did they do? So I just built a fairly, not a very sophisticated model, but it was enough so that it made some predictions about what would happen. Uh, let's see. So it's hard to see here, but there's little things that run around, and I'll start running it. Little things that run around, basically wolves and elk. The elk are seeking food when they get hungry, and there's a bunch of simulation properties that control the simulation. In this case, it's a lot of them. And the students were challenged with making a stable population by initially just changing the parameters that govern the system. When does a, when does a wolf get hungry? When does an elk get hungry? When it gets hungry, um, it goes looking for food. What's the starvation threshold if they don't get there in time? How, when do they die of old age? When do they reproduce? And um, there were about 10 parameters that they could play with. There were more, but those are the 10 I let them play with. And I said, just pick one. And they would investigate um, what happens when you change these parameters and record the data, make some graphs, and then make predictions about what if I change it this way? Can I get to a stable population? Now, the yellow is the, the population of the elk in this case, and the blue is the population of the wolves. And so it looks sort of stable. But if you run it long, and I said, OK, you know, you got to motivate kids. So I always do it with candy and money. So I said, um, if you can make this simulation run at least 1,000 cycles, and I think, what am I up to right now? What does it say here? Uh, simulation cycles. 
411. You can make it run to 1,000, I will give you a presidential coin. That's my favorite. And I buy them in rolls, and they're shiny, and so you can't get them in. You can't go to the bank and get them shiny like I get them. Um, really sad they stopped that program. But anyway, um, and I lost a lot of money because they all, they all figured out how to do it. <laughs> okay, both classes. Um, but the idea is, with a fairly, it's not that much programming. So here's the programming for the elk. Let me just close this here. Get this out of the way. So the elk's program is basically this. It's being strobed, so it's being controlled with a controller that says, do it now, do it now, do it now. And so it says, well, have I reached my, my uh, starvation threshold yet? In other words, is my hunger level greater than the level at which I would starve? If so, I'm dead, and we update a statistic. They're dying. Okay, yeah, they're dying, and now when the population of prey gets below the population of the predators, you know you got a problem, okay? And so this population is gonna crash, but I almost got to 1,000, okay? 700, uh, what did I get to? I don't know. Okay, I got to 830, so I might have won a dollar pretty soon if I had just play with it. But the program that they would make is, um, if hunger is greater than the, the hunger, the starvation threshold, I die. If um, the age is greater than the age limit, in other words, you die of old age. So you can die of hunger and you can die of old age, and of course, elk can be eaten. If that happens, I die. Otherwise, I have to stay, update a couple of statistics for my agent, that is my, me, the elk, or me, the wolf, or the, it's the same kind of program for the wolf. I'm up, update my hunger, my age, and my reproduction status, and then I'll go figure out what I have to do. And the first thing I ask is, am I hungry? In other words, is my hunger level greater than the, the level at which I should start looking for food? Otherwise, I don't need to do anything. If I'm not hungry, then I say, am I ready to reproduce? In which case, the reproduction is pretty simple. Just make two, you make another one, okay? So they don't mate. That's a problem with this model. However, it was interesting what it could predict without with being so grossly inaccurate. Otherwise, I'll just move around randomly. That's the program. Well, what do I do if I'm hungry? Well, I got to go seek food. How do I seek food? I use hill climbing and the, the matrix, the floor is just diffusing the scent of all the hay that I, or the willow I have to go find. And ditto for the, the wolves, it's, the, it's diffusing the scent of the, of the elk. So with a relative few, few constru uh, instructions, I have a model that I can now play with. What's fascinating is this model showed something that only this, I guess it was maybe in August, the research came out. You would think, you know, common wisdom was, if you double the prey, you will double the population of the predator. You know, more food, more, pre more predators. It doesn't work that way. The ratio of predators to prey goes down as the number of prey go up. And then this model actually showed that. I had no idea what was, why it was doing that. It was probably doing it for a different mechanism. But it was quite in interesting to see that. And what the students were doing is they were doing some research to see, well, what, what's the population dynamics? What is it? What are they like? What's the most important thing? This model also said something that we, then the students watched a video, another recent video, a National Geographic, I think it was National Geographic, where some scientists discovered something that was totally unexpected. So this model says, if you're hungry, go eat. If you're not, then check whether you should reproduce. In other words, um, self-preservation comes ahead of species preservation, so to speak. Okay, well, we all know in biology that species preservation takes precedence over uh, self-preservation. Except when you look at it, really, it does it really. So when they looked at this situation in Africa, where there was a, a very disabled, disfigured lioness, an older lioness whose jaw was disfigured, so much so from an injury, she couldn't really tear you know, flesh apart. And they showed a kill, and all the younger lions were eating away, and then this elderly one walks over, tries to eat the hide, can't do it. And another lioness walked over and spread the carcass apart so that this injured one, or this one that was disabled, could eat. They had never seen this altruistic behavior before, ever. Well, this model is wrong, okay? So that, okay. oh, you have to walk in again? So the students could, see, they watched the video and I said, what's the matter with this model? I said, oh, well, if I want to change the model, what do I do? 
flip the rules. Just flip those two rules. I have a totally different model. So the idea of the project that we, it's called a scalable game design project, is to take a language like this, which doesn't have a lot of constructions, and lets you build some very sophisticated games, and hopefully they can turn you to make STEM models. And then, if you're interested in the science, great. But now you know about computational thinking. And you can use whatever programming tools are used in your discipline. Or if you really want to get under the hood and get into you know, Java or JavaScript or Python or whatever, you can see the structure of that code that's a consequence of the blocks that you or the, the rules that you created. Anyway, if you want to play with it, if, um, if you go to that website, the first time you create a game, it'll ask you to create a, a, an account. So you just give it a, you know, your email and, a, and a, an account name and a password and it will email you a link back to your game. And for the rest of this year, the entire thing is unlocked, okay? There's a light version that you can do some things in, but you can't do a lot in. But the, the entire thing is unlocked. And if you would like to permanently unlock it for the rest of the year, if you go to the website, when you, when you follow that link, it'll take you back to your game and it remains unlocked. But if you want to make a different game and you try to do it through the hour of code, it's a little arcane at this point. I'm trying to get to fix it. You have to kind of scroll down and say, I already have an account, and then it'll send you to that account. Or you can log in directly to Agent Cubes Online, which is where all this stuff is housed. But then you can't just make a new game with the full version. So if you want to write this down, it's um, capital H, capital O-C, so H-O-C, all caps, hyphen, preview in lowercase. And you can enter that as a code, and you now have access to the full version. The, the agent sheets company model is they sell their software and now they're selling subscriptions and you know that's an issue for schools that you know don't have money but they have ways that you can do the research oh did I lose it again um, you know and then get the software for your school it's really aimed at mostly middle schools now getting to a little bit into high school with simulation also down at the elementary school level I'll try to just move this around uh, um, and, and, and Bitsbox, which Brian mentioned, has a totally different model. Okay, their, their software is free, and what they sell is magazines. So that every month you get a magazine with a little kit of some toys and, and stuff like that. And, so, and, and the magazine has a way for you to investigate new games and new, new programming paradigms. So it's interesting to see the different mod, uh, you know, business models and, and how well they're, <laughs> I think both companies are kind of <laughs> dealing with struggling there. But anyway, um, if you have any questions, you know, you know where I live, and you can send me some emails. <laughs> Any questions right now? Is this like NetLogo? No. Um, ne uh, you mean in terms of like the, the, the language? Logo, has some sim simulations. Oh, you mean like Star Logo, for example? Um, they, have some, they have some really powerful simulations. Try to try to modify one of those. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the the Guts Project, GUTS, New Mexico. That's a really a, amazing stuff and a lot of them use a star logo and there's a couple out in North Carolina that have done a lot of star logo stuff amazing models but really but modifying them is really hard you really have to understand logo to, and really have to be able to get into the code to do that and and so that's that's kind of an inhibitor you, they're they're wonderful models to use and their biological models are good for for getting kids interest, exposed to just running the model and playing with the parameters but this lets you say, I want to change it, or I want to make a different model. And that's, that's difficult with their models. Any other questions? OK, I'll turn your thing back over to you. Well, uh, to wrap up the week. Yeah, I, I, I just have about next meeting. Yeah. Uh, let me get out of here. Come back. Uh, you can just yeah, do you want to resist your mouse? Oh, yeah, my mouse. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I think uh, we, we ended up closing that, that uh, URL. Slides deep is this? Well, I, 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 I
Yeah, it's the second to last one, just has some dates on there, okay. Yeah, right there. Okay, so I kind of want to wrap up quickly. I don't know nobody wants to get home to get some rest so you can shovel snow in the morning. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I appreciate that you come. I hope that you feel these meetings are worthwhile. I feel like we don't have the time to cover the stuff that I should be aware of. So, um, but it's tough because there's only so many times we can meet. But I will tell you, I was talking with Tracy and Cindy about the next meeting, and I would like us to go back to School of Mines this next meeting, if that's all right with everybody. And uh, I checked into dates that were okay with them, and we did talk earlier last spring about, or I guess this summer about, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are our best days, but Tuesdays are good for some people, Wednesdays are good for others. So uh, trying to alternate between Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So we're probably looking at a Wednesday next meeting. I at least want to keep that kind of promise to people, alternating Tuesdays and Wednesdays, at least for this year. So January 27th or, Fe or February 24th are two days that they suggest. And I just want to know how people feel about that. So uh, if you think uh, it makes a difference to you which one of those. Let me just take a quick hand count. How, how many of you would prefer to have our next meeting on January 27th? Okay, so, so how many on February 24th? Let's, let's just take a quick hand cut again then with, with that thread in mind. January 27th, if you'd like that one. And February 24th. Okay. We'll probably go ahead and if we can schedule the 27th to see what comes up for them. Uh, we will meet, like I said, at Colorado School of Mines. Um, Please let me know if you have agenda items. I mean, there's more stuff that we want to put in the meeting than we ever can, but let me know and um, we'll see what feels most important and we'll do that. So again, I appreciate you being, being here. I hope it was worthwhile. Thanks to everybody, particularly those that presented tonight. And thanks again to Brian and to Spark. Thank you very much. Uh, real quick, can I? I um, that CS Ed Week kind of section, I wasn't sure if Fred was going to talk about this, but um, there's a group of folks here in Boulder that are planning a big kickoff event on the Sunday, the Sunday of CS Ed Week at uh, Galvanized Boulder. And so I think we, let's see if it, so we re reserved a site, csed.co. So it's a funny URL, but csed.colorado.co. Um, and I don't know if it's been updated, but oh, look at this. Wow, they've been, they've been busy. It looks really pretty. Um, but there is, actually, I, let's see what the schedule does. Wow, that's fancy. Um, there's a kickoff. I don't think it's on here yet. But there's a kickoff at Galvanize. Uh, we're from... <coughs> Two to four, two to four, um, at Galvanized, which is downtown Boulder. It's a big kind of tech uh, co-working space that's also doing uh, boot camp, uh, coding boot camp as well, and a bunch of other really cool things there. Um, so if you're able to make it, that would be great. Um, and then also, we are we want to share all of the events that people are doing. So whether it's something that's down in Highlands Ranch or Littleton or uh, Colorado Springs. We want to just post these up here so that if people in Colorado are seeing it, they're like, oh, I didn't know that Erie Middle School or Altona is doing this thing, you know. Um, it'd be, we're trying to uh, aggregate all of those common events across the state, so. Cool, awesome, yes, great. Also, there's gonna be, at the end of that week, Capstone event where the, the students who have been doing stuff during the week or actually didn't have to just be that week, but what they've done are going to show.
showcase some projects, especially some prizes and stuff like yep. that. So we're going to bookend it. Basically, the group has decided to bookend it on, on either end, the opening kickoff and then kind of a showcase at the end at the Boulder Public Library um, where we can kind of just celebrate and eat some food and hang out and talk about how geeky we are. <laughs> and the Good Code folks are, are hosting an almost hackathon on the weekend of February 13th, 14th at Boulder Public Library as well. Cool. They had 24 last weekend, and they're hoping to do a lot better than that this next time. Cool. Well, thank you very much, guys, and drive safely. Oh, if you uh, just um, you know, either bring this stuff back up here or. Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, you need to keep right.